So I'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you for this class and just ask that you just bless our work today. Help us to uh, glorify you and what we do, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So guys, I hope you're uh, getting used to your classes and so forth. And I hope you've started looking at the homework in here. Um, some of it you probably could do. But there's a couple of problems in particular that you'll really need me to um, give the lecture I'm about to give here. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. So the thing I want to talk about today for, let's see, so what I'm gonna do, let me just give, kind of give you a forecast of what's happening today. So the first probably 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about a really new topic. And then I'm gonna to try to connect that with what we've done already, all right, and with Calculus 3. So the new topic at the moment is differential forms. And the wedge product. Now, so let me just start by telling you what differential forms look like, all right? Um, so a zero form would be something like f, and and tell you what I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the context uh, concrete here. So we'll just we'll just look um, we'll start by looking at differential forms in three dimensions because that's a little bit more interesting. But we're really more really more mostly interested in two dimensions. Truth be told, so a zero form is just a function of you know three variables. Let's say then a one form is something like alpha has the form adx plus bdy plus cdz. All right? This is a one form. A two form, so at the moment, these things we've seen before, right? You're like, well, that's not new. We integrated those in calculus three, right? We talked about the integral of pdx plus qdy plus rdz, right? That was the line integral. Remember? Yeah. So one forms, I think you've already worked with, really. Two form, though, it's a little bit new. So here, beta would be something like, let's say, a dy wedge dz plus b um, dz wedge dx plus c dx wedge dy. So this is the wedge product. Now, the wedge product is a new thing, all right? It's a, it's a construction that you can make with differentials to construct new things. You could think about these wedge products in some sense as being identified with volume. Um, well, in this case, area. So this is like a little x, y, z area. This is kind of like a little z, x area. This is kind of like a little oriented x, y area. So in some sense, they're like encoding areas, all right? That's just a mnemonic, a, a quick uh, way of understanding it. A three form would be something like gamma which is some function g um, times dx wedge dy wedge dz. So a three form has to do with, with volume, or really a three volume. Now, you can talk about differential forms in n dimensions. In n dimensions, you'd have zero forms all the way out to n forms, all right? Um, but in three dimensions, this is it. Past this, you can't have a non-trivial four form. So like the basic rules for the wedge product are, are as follows. For instance, dx wedge dy is equal to minus dy wedge dx. All right? This is, by definition, how the wedge product works. So what does it say about like dx wedge dx? So by the same rule, right? Minus dx wedge dx. What happens if something's equal to minus itself? What's that say? If I have x equals to minus x, what's that mean about x? x is equal to? Zero, right, because two x is equal to zero. So this, this tells me that dx wedge dx is equal to zero. And likewise, that's supposed to be a likewise, dy wedge dy is equal to zero, and dz wedge dz is equal to zero, All right? So what does this remind you of? In calculus three, we talk about vectors and taking their products, right? We got dot product, we got cross product, right? This is how the cross product behaved, right? 
the cross product of a vector with itself was zero. Now, it's not true that the wedge product of a differential form with itself is necessarily zero. Um, sometimes that's true, but not always. And also, there's some properties here. So some properties like if we have alpha wedge beta plus gamma, you probably could guess what that is. Alpha wedge um, beta wedge gamma is alpha wedge beta wedge gamma. So first of all, like if you have the wedge product with a sum, you get the regular like distributive property like this. That's one property of the wedge product by definition, essentially. And <clears throat> the other thing that makes the wedge product really different from the cross product is that it's associative. So here, if I put parentheses here and put parentheses there, it makes sense. I always tell engineering students to be on the watch. If you see an engineering book that writes this, just unadorned, just writes that, that means whoever wrote that book doesn't know what they're doing. Because that doesn't make sense. See, because cross product is not associative. So like this is not usually equal to this. Right? But with the wedge product, it is an associative product, among other things. And it, o it obeys the usual laws of arithmetic. Now, one thing it does do that's really different is it satisfies this rule. Alpha wedge beta is equal to minus 1 to the uh, PQ beta wedge alpha if alpha is P form and beta is Q form. So that's just a quick overview of the structure of the wedge product. It's, it's a lot like what you already know, but it, it's kind of like the cross product, but it's also kind of not. Now there's a couple of correspondences we should introduce. The one is that every one form in three dimensions corresponds to a vector field. This is the so-called work form correspondence. So I'll put it up here. This by definition is I'll use omega sub a, b, c. So here a, b, and c I'm thinking of as, as smooth functions. All right. So omega a, b, c, it's the vector field, excuse me, it's the one form which corresponds to the vector field a, b, c. All right. So to every vector field we have a corresponding one form. This is the work form correspondence. And if you'll let me erase the, uh, this bit right here. <coughs> oh man, look at that mess. It's okay, I brought the juice. We're good. Um, <clears throat> there's also a so-called flux form correspondence. So the, a two form in three dimensions corresponds to, here's my notation, definition phi of A, B, C. So every two form in three dimensions, you need three component functions. I've labeled them A, B, and C to get this two form. All right. Now it is a quirk of three dimensions that both one forms and two forms take three component functions to define. If you're in four dimensions or five dimensions, it's not so. There's more two forms. There's more three forms over there. Well, that's not true. Three forms and one forms correspond in four dimensions. But anyway, so it's the work form correspondence. That's the flux form correspondence. Let's look at an algebra. Let's look at an example here. So I'll, I'll keep it somewhat generic because adding numbers here doesn't really help much. But what happens if we look at like omega A wedge omega B? What's that going to work out to? So here I'm saying like A1 dx plus A2 dy plus A3 dz wedged with B1 dx, B2 dy, plus B3 dz. Let's work this out. Let's try to understand what this wedge product is doing for us. All right. So 
So I'm going to tell you about the algebra of the wedge product, then I'm going to talk you about, tell you about the differential calculus of the wedge product, and then finally I'll tell you about the integral calculus of the wedge product here. It's going to be a very short course. Um, okay, so we, we just distribute. And so like, for instance, we're going to have, well, let me just write, let me just point out what doesn't matter. dx wedge dx is zero, so that doesn't appear. So we have a1, b2, dx wedge dy, plus a2, b1, dy wedge dx. And then we have a1, b3, dx wedge dz, plus a3, um, b1, dz wedge dx. Two more. Um, let's see here, I think I've exhausted a1 now. Yeah, so a2, a2, b3, dy wedge dz, plus a3, b2, dz wedge d, uh, dy. I should have one, two, three, four, five, six terms, yeah. The other three are zero because dx wedge dx is zero, dy wedge dy is zero, dz wedge dz is zero. All right? Now we just group terms, and I'm going to group terms with the target of the flux form correspondence in mind, all right? So I want to put my y z terms first. So like y z, I've got a2 b3 minus, I can't do math, uh, a2 b3 is what I said, didn't I? Minus a3 b2, that's dy wedge dz. Next up we've got, what's the next thing I'm aiming for? dz, zx, I want to keep zx, so that's a3, b1, minus a1, b3, um, dz wedge dx. Where's the minus coming from? Do you guys understand? So the minus is coming from the wedge product. I had to, see I had to flip dy wedge dx to dx wedge dy. I had to flip dx wedge dz to dz wedge dx. I had to flip dz wedge dy to dy wedge dz, respectively for these minus terms. All right? Anybody here recognize what this is? What are you looking at? What are these the component functions of? You guys have had physics one, calc three. You've worked a little bit with this product, the cross product, right? That is the cross product of vectors A and B. So we've derived the cross product from these simple algebra rules. And more than that, I can be a little bit more specific here. What we're looking at is the flux form of vector A cross vector B. For instance, this right here is the second component of A cross B, right? And so forth. So the wedge product does give you the cross product. I mean, they're not the same, right? The wedge product is, the wedge product of two one forms does not give you another one form, it gives you a two form. So it's called an exterior product. What, what do you guys think happens if we take the uh, wedge product of A with B with C? So in other words, you'd have, um, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you what happens. You end up with A dot B cross C times DX wedge DY wedge DZ. That's how it works out. Unfortunately, we don't have three hours of lecture time for this topic, so I can't do everything, but that's how it works out. So the wedge product also allows you to put dot products in formulas in this way. Do you guys, this is the triple product, right? So this gives you the volume of the parallel pi fed with edges A, B, and C, right? So the wedge product of the three one forms corresponding to vectors A, B, C gives you the three form whose volume is exactly that, right? Okay, so there's that. Let's talk about differentiation. You've already learned the first step in this story. What's the differential of a function? 
we talked about this already. It is partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy plus partial f partial z. Now here is context, right? In three dimensions, that's the differential, right? In two dimensions, you just got the dx and dy, right? So the context matters. The number of independent variables corresponds to the number of partial derivatives you take. But there it is. This is the exterior derivative of a one form. Now what is this? What's, the, what's going on here? Well, this is the work form of the gradient, right? So the exterior derivative of a function corresponds to the work form of the gradient vector field of that function, right? This has been right in front of you the whole time in Calculus 3, right? But we don't really develop a language to make it explicit. This is the language to make that correspondence explicit. If we have a one form, if we take the exterior derivative of a one form, let's say g to keep things a little bit different, then we're talking about <coughs> taking the, so what we have to do is we're, we're taking the exterior derivative of like g1 dx plus g2 dy plus g3 dz. Now I haven't defined this yet guys, but I'm going to define it right now. How do you take the exterior derivative of a one form? The exterior, we never did this in calculus 3. This is totally new, right? The definition is very simple actually. You just take the differential of the components, like dg1, and you wedge it with dx. The differential of g2, you wedge it with dy. The differential of g3, you wedge it with dz. Right. This calculus I'm showing you guys is the calculus that's needed to understand equations for physics and engineering in higher dimensions. If you study like fluid mechanics, for example, you might study um, how to understand that from like a, a manifold perspective, from a differential geometric perspective. And these are the kinds of calculations that you might need to do. Um, anyway, more on that later. But so th these, so we already we already know how to take the differential of functions, right? It's just right here. So like, for example, let me expand this. This particular one would be what? It's partial x g1 dx plus partial y g1 dy plus partial z g1 dz. If you want a, you know, a more a briefer notation for the differential. What happens when you take the wedge product of that with x? What, what piece dies? dx. Yeah, dx wedge dx dies. And so all you're left with is the two other terms. Yeah? So this is a short calculation we don't have time for. <laughs> um, but if you look at my Calculus 3 playlist, you'll find I do this year after year after year, this calculation. And what you'll find is that this is, in fact, the flux form of what? What, what kind of derivative doesn't have derivatives of the x component with respect to x, but it does have derivatives of the y component with respect to z, and the z component with respect to y. It's got all of the components differentiated with respect to the other variables. That is the curl. It actually gives us the flux form of the curl if you work this out. It's a straightforward calculation we don't have time for. <laughs> so um, there's that. So the exterior derivative, defined as such, naturally folds in the curl calculation. Eh? It's kind of neat. What about the exterior derivative of a two-form? So what if you have a flux form of a vector field f, let's say? So, you know, we would have the exterior derivative of f1, let's see here, dy wedge dz, uh, plus f2 dz wedge dx, plus f3 dx wedge dy, and again, the definition of the exterior derivative is take the total differential of the components and wedge it with the wedges that are there. It's simply that. I assure you mathematicians can find a more complicated way to say that, but that's all it is. So once I learned this as an undergraduate, I was like, oh, this is actually really simple and kind of neat. And when I saw that you can derive things like the Jacobian from Calculus 3 with these, th with these things naturally. 
um, I was sold personally. But anyway, what happens with these these differentials is, of course, again, they've got x, y, z derivatives, right? Packaged respectively with dx, dy, dz. When you take the wedge product with y, z, if you've got any y or z, it, it goes to zero. If there's any repeated dx or dy, dz, zero. So all that remains from here is the x derivative, right? So a short calculation, and what you get is like partial xf1 plus partial yf2 plus partial zf3. And you can rearrange the differentials so that they're all dx wedge dy wedge dz. What is that? Hmm. You guys did have calc 3, yes? I know you had calc 3, you're here. So that, that's the divergence, my friends. I know it was at the end of the course, so you think it doesn't count, but in fact it does. The whole point of calculus 3 is the end of the course, guys. If it wasn't for the end of the course, if it wasn't for vector calculus, there'd be really little purpose of teaching you calculus 3. This is where calculus 3 is actually applied in the study of flux of vector fields and engineering and so forth. But there it is, that's the divergence. So we have the gradient, the curl, and the divergence all appearing as different aspects of the exterior derivative. Which is, I think, a pretty neat unified uh, you know, thing. Now, the fundamental identity for the exterior derivative is this. d squared is equal to zero. It's sometimes been said that you can put all the equations of physics into this single identity. I'm not sure that's actually true, but it does make a snazzy claim. So d squared is zero. What I mean by that is if you take the exterior derivative of f, what's that? It's the exterior derivative of the work form of the gradient, right? Which is the flux form. So apply the next thing. It's the flux form. So I put gradient in the place of g. So it's the flux form of the curl of the gradient. Do you guys remember that? <coughs> you probably don't remember. But the curl of the gradient is identically zero. And if you look at d squared on um, the, the work, work form, let's say, that's the exterior derivative of the flux form, right, of the curl. And that is the divergence of the curl. So these two well-known vector identities, that the divergence of the curl is zero and that the curl of the gradient is zero, the, both of these well-known vector identities fold into the single identity of the exterior derivative. When you operate twice on the exterior derivative, you get zero. I've showed you this for three dimensions. Well, I, guess, I, I guess I told you <coughs> integration, right? So let's go back to integration. And then I'll drop down to two dimensions, probably, since that's where we live in this course, <laughs> for the most part. <clears throat> That's not entirely true. <laughs> we do solve like three, three differential equations at once. Or four, I suppose. But the integral calculus, this won't take long actually, surprisingly. The integral um, of the work form over a curve, the integral of the flux form over a surface, the integral of a uh, volume form over a volume. This is the integral of f dot dr over the curve. This is the integral, maybe you use a double integral, I don't know, it depends on like the book and the notation and stuff, I, I don't remember what's the standard notation in Stewart. But like the integral of a one form is exactly the line integral of the vector field to which it corresponds. The integral of a two form is exactly the flux integral of the vector field to which it corresponds. The integral of a three form, I think you know where I'm going with this, is exactly the volume integral that you already know and love, but no wedges. 
right? So all of these are oriented integrals. So there's like a there's an orientation that's um, built into the wedges. Of course, you're used to like line integrals and flux integrals being oriented, right? The integral one way along a curve is minus the integral the other way. And the integral of the flux, the flux of a vector field, if you orient the surface one way, if you orient the surface the other way, it changes the sign of that flux calculation, yeah? But all of the notions of vector calculus that we study can be implemented as integrals of differential forms, all right? And there's one, uh, one theorem that uh, binds them all, and it's this, the generalized Stokes theorem. And it simply says this, it says that the integral over a space of the differential of a form is equal to the integral over the boundary of the space of the form. This single statement reproduces the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals, Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, and the divergence theorem. <laughs> so like, for instance, if we look at, uh, now it requires some interpretation, of course, but like, for instance, the integral um, along a curve of the differential of a function is equal to the integral over the boundary of the curve of the function. So here a function, I mean a curve, I mean like an oriented curve from say point P to point Q. So what we mean here, so this by the way, is the integral along the curve of the work form of the, of the gradient to the function, right? And that is the integral of the vector field, which in this case is the gradient vector field over the curve, which what is, the, uh, what is the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals say? It says that that is equal to what? f of q minus f of p, right? And that is exactly what is meant by this here. Like the boundary of a curve is just its endpoints. So that's the first instance of the generalized Stokes theorem, just the regular fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. The next instance would be if we look at the integral of um, the exterior derivative of a one form, right? And not a curve, but this time a surface. That would be equal to the integral over the boundary of the surface um, of, oh man, one moment. Uh, just a second here. Let me let me get this straight here. I gotta put the uh, my brain broke. <laughs> Give me a second here. I have uh, got myself twisted. Let's think about this. So the next one would be, let's see here. So if we're integrating over the boundary of a surface, that would be, a, um, that would be the omega sub f. That would be equal to the integral over the surface of the differential of omega f, all right? And that translates literally well, that, that's equal to the integral over the surface of the flux form of the curl of f. We almost worked that out. And you see what this translates into? This translates to the integral over the boundary of the surface of f dot dr is equal to the integral over the surface of the curl. What's this guy? What's this? What's this? Can you guys tell me what this theorem is I'm writing? I just put a box around. What theorem is that? It has a name. Say my name. Say it. Divergence theorem. Try again. Good guess, though. That is one of the other two choices remaining. 
the divergence theorem actually would come from looking at the integral over the boundary of a volume of the flux form of, let's say, G equal to the integral over the volume of the, der the exterior derivative of the flux um, exterior derivative of the flux form of G, which would give you like the integral over the boundary of the volume of G dot dS equals the integral over the volume of the divergence of G. That's the divergence theorem. Now this is this is what? I'm gonna have to talk to the calculus three instructors. Like what's going on in here? <laughs> you guys must know this theorem. Hey, some of you had it with me. I've, it's been over a year. Uh, this is no excuse. So. I have a bad memory. I don't know. Why are you going to school? What's the point? I mean, <laughs> like, I need credentials to get a job. I'm like, okay, fine, you got me. That's true. Why don't we just print degrees, though? It'd be so much simpler. I just need one really good laser printer and some really quality paper. I can make you all guys all doctors. Here's your PhD. Here's your PhD, right? Just think about it. I have other ideas like this. Like sometimes we talk about like the problem with S rates in calculus. You know, how can we increase the success rates? And I've always suggested that if the professors just took the tests for the students, <laughs> it would be much better. You know, we know the material. Why are we making you guys learn the material? I mean, come on. Just saying. No, this is Stokes theorem. You guys are killing me. This is the regular Stokes theorem. So the generalized Stokes theorem automatically gets all of these different theorems. But it's so much more than this, guys, because this system of calculus works in, in, in arbitrary dimensions, and it naturally adapts to curved spaces, right? So anyway, if you'd like to know more about differential forms in their calculus, do please join me for advanced calculus. Oh, next semester, yeah. So. <laughs> You're like, was this just an advertisement? <laughs> um, a little bit, but I really do think it's important for you guys to be aware of this mathematics because it's, it's kind of like important. For example, like all of string theory, if you were to try to understand current theoretical physics, it's all written in terms of differential forms because you can't really talk about like vector fields too much. Vector fields don't do enough for like 10 dimensional physics. You need to talk about what are called fluxes, which are, which are differential forms. Um, but anyway, getting back to the point here. Um, in two dimensions, uh, two dimensional, it's a little bit simpler. We either have a function, which is a zero form, right? Or we have like, <laughs> um, what's our, what, what does our one form look like? We got a PDX plus QDY, right? That's it, and um, and then we've <laughs> we've got um, well, there's just there's just one. It's like this is this is it. This is the two form. This is so like differential forms in two dimensions. You've got zero forms. You got one forms. You got two forms. You can't have a three form because you can't have dx wedge dy wedge dz. You only got x and y to work with. All right, that's it. Now. <clears throat> I need to give you guys a definition. Now this is beyond two dimensions. This is just like a general definition. A differential form um, let's say alpha is closed if d alpha is equal to zero. Alright, a differential form is closed if d alpha equals to zero. A differential form uh, phi, well, let's not say phi, let's say beta, is exact. And, and um, okay, so fine print, I, I should include some fine print here. Uh, both exact and closed are conditions that are subject to like some kind of context. Let's say on U, and we'll, we'll keep it real here, so we'll just say a subset of Rn. All right, so it could, n could be two for us, usually three, whatever. So it's exact on u, a subset of Rn. That's the context. If there exists 
let's say phi um, such that beta is equal to the differential of phi. So you might recognize this as kind of being like our discussion of conservative vector fields, right? A vector field can be written as the derivative of something else as a conservative vector field in the sense of gradient, right? So in fact, this is sometimes called phi is the, is the potential form. The potential form, all right? So a closed form is one whose exterior derivative is zero. An exact form is one which is the exterior derivative of something else, all right? There's a fundamental theorem. This is an easy theorem. Every closed form is, um, oh my bad, I'm an idiot. Every exact form, this is what happens when I try to teach math at this time. <coughs> Every exact form is closed. <coughs> Here's the proof of that. It's, it's very silly. Watch. So if we take d of a exact form beta, that's what? That's d of d phi. But what did I tell you about the exterior derivative? If we do it twice, we get 0. Right? This is a general identity of the calculus. So like every exact form is closed. The exterior derivative <coughs> of an exact form <coughs> is closed, is 0. Therefore, it's closed. The converse to this is subtle. <clears throat> so the converse to this, <clears throat> sadly, I think I drank all my coffee already. Oh, no, I didn't. Woo -hoo. It's a good day. I didn't pour it all over me. So. <clears throat> This is um, <coughs> um, from Poincaré. I can't spell. Anyway, <coughs> um, if U, a subset of Rn, is simply connected, then <coughs> if, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, if phi is closed, then phi is exact. In other words, <clears throat> let me let me um, let me put this into practice for us here. So, like, um, we're, for instance, suppose. You have <coughs> a um, alpha equal to PDX plus QDY, right? Is closed. What would that mean? <coughs> that means that D alpha, right? which is what? That's dp wedge dx plus dq wedge dy, which is what? px dx plus qy dy wedge dx plus qx dx. Plus, oh, man. Sorry. Yes. Oh, come on. I'm sorry, guys. It's my bad. py dy. qx dx. If I could just calculate instead of, if I could like think instead of just write, that would be good. All right. So the exterior derivative of the p function, the exterior derivative of the q, the differential of the p, the differential of the q. But of course, this with this is zero, and that with that is zero. So what are we left with? We're just left with qx minus py dx wedge dy. 
all right? If this is a closed differential form, it means that the exterior derivative of alpha must be equal to zero. So we need what? Qx minus Py equals to zero. This is the closed condition. In fact, last class I called it the closed condition. I think I did it with m and n, and I think I said like m sub y is equal to n sub x. The x derivative of the y component of the Fafian form must be equal to the x, uh, the y derivative of the x component of the, of the Fafian form, right? That was the closed condition. We needed that for the differential equation to be what? Exact. These words align with the meaning here. So if this is equal to zero, then what? There exists f such that df is equal to <coughs> alpha. But that means what we're saying is like partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy is equal to pdx plus qdy. So an exact differential equation is one which can be written in terms of an exact one form. But more to the point here, we can, so like, let me just kind of like give you a completely calculational way of thinking about it. All right? Example, what example am I on? Example one? <laughs> Maybe example one. Example three. example three, okay. I think I called some of my theorems examples today just to make you feel like I did an example. It's something I do. But, um, so check this out. So if we have, like the differential equation, oh, I don't know, x plus y dx um, plus, let's say, y squared um, dy equals to zero. We can ask the question, is this an exact equation? Well, you see, if it was, that would be an exact form. And then that would mean that the exterior derivative of the equation should be zero. But calculate the exterior derivative of this. If I take the differential of this, we get dx plus dy wedge dx plus like the differential of y squared is 2y dy wedge dy, right? And is this equal to zero? It's not, see, because, well, this, this piece goes to zero and this piece goes to zero. This remains. We've got dy wedge dx, which is in fact not equal to zero. So this means it's not exact. Why is it not? It's not exact because it's not closed. If it was exact, it would be closed, but it's not because the exterior derivative is non-zero. Now, if you don't like that, that's fine. You don't have to think of it this way. Of course, we can drop back to thinking this is P and this is Q or M and N if you like, and it's just not the case that P sub Y is not equal to Q sub X, right? because p sub y is what? Is 1, and q sub x is 0. So therefore, the closed condition is not met. Therefore, this is not an exact equation. All right? You do need to learn some version of this in order to test for exactness of a differential equation. All right? Any questions? So if you'd like to see an expanded version, if you're interested in this more, like I said, you can come take advanced calculus if you want. I, I spend a lot of the semester on like developing differential forms and like studying them and so forth. And um, <clears throat> this, this process of like finding, the process of like finding the potential form, which whose exterior derivative is the other thing, is tantamount to how you find like potential energy in physics for a vector field. But there's beyond that, there's something beyond the original course. There's something called a vector potential. For the magnetic field, there's something called a vector potential. And that construction also covers the vector potential. And it covers a host of other things we don't have names for. So it's the origin of what's called potential theory. And the in more interesting thing from a mathematical perspective, and this has started to make inroads into modern engineering and su such, is that it's the base of what's called Durham cohomology. So Durham cohomology
is basically a way of studying um, holes in space via the existence of differential forms on the space. All right, so like um, basically if there is, um, if there's a closed form which is not exact, that means that there's something topologically interesting about the space. And um, topology, topology applied to engineering is pretty cutting edge. Like that would be, the, that would get you papers and stuff in engineering, I'm pretty sure. You could publish that probably. Um, <clears throat> This math's about 100 years old, something like that. These differential forms were done by Cartan around like the turn of the 20th century, something like that. The stuff by Pfaff is earlier, you know, it's like 1830s. Pfaff was the advisor of Gauss. I want to show you an example here of this. And so this is example four. If we integrate minus y dx plus x dy over x squared plus y squared. Let me just double check. I want to make sure I don't put the wrong sign there. Yeah, it's okay. All right. And let's integrate this over a circle of radius r. You guys know how to do it. What do you do? How do you do this calculation? You integrate, how do you integrate this vector field over the circle? We know this. Parameterize the circle, plug the parametric equations in, we're done, right? What are the parametric equations for a circle of radius r? You got yourself an r cosine t, you got yourself a y equals r sine t, yeah? And you do the calculation, integral from 0 to 2 pi, and notice that dx here is minus r sine t dt and dy is r cosine t dt. What happens when you do y dx plus x dy here? What do you get? I get, get like a, a minus sine t times r times minus r sine t dt. Hey, sine squared. There's a sine squared from the first one. There's a cosine squared from the second one. Tilt your head and squint. What you get is r squared sine squared t plus cosine squared t dt divided by x squared plus y squared, which is r squared. Well, look at that. This is the integral of dt from 0 to 2 pi. So you guess what? This is, the, uh, this is 2 pi. 2 pi. This is not at all surprising because this particular differential form is exactly the exterior derivative of the angle function. See this is the exterior derivative of theta in the sense that theta is the inverse tangent of y over x. Now that, that formula inverse tangent y over x only makes sense for part of the circle. But um, my point to you is this is not surprising. Okay, this differential form let me call it omega. Notice that d omega is nevertheless <laughs> that. So the omega is what? And you could try this out yourself. You could take the exterior derivative of omega and work it out with x and y and what you'll find is you get zero. So omega is a closed form. Is it an exact form? Well, check this out. If omega was equal to, you know, df, then the integral over the curve of omega would be equal to the integral over the, um, the curve of df, which would be the integral over the boundary of the curve of f, which should be zero because the boundary of the circle is zero. And yet it's not zero, is it? It's what? It's 2 pi. Why is this? 
because it's closed. It is true that it's closed, yeah. But my, my question is, why is it that we have this differential form which is closed, but it's certainly not exact? If it was exact, it would contradict the explicit calculation we did right here. And the answer is that there's topology in this problem. You might say, what topology? I said topology in some sense is the study of holes in the abstract space, all right? Where's the hole here? So if I draw a picture of the plane, this is kind of a small picture, but imagine that's the plane, right? What's the problem? Where is omega not defined? At the origin, that's right. So this is actually missing from the domain of omega. So this is, it's actually defined on the punctured plane and the fact that the origin, th this is not simply connected. Like if I take a loop around the origin and I try to deform it, I get stuck on that origin. The punctured plane is the quintessential example of a space that has a hole in it. And the existence of the differential of the angle function is, is what is the starting story of this story of Durham cohomology. But anyway, just getting you started on something. I will stop. This, by the way, I have been misbehaving this week. I will behave much better the rest of the semester. I will be showing you techniques of differential equations and how to solve problems that are standard in the syllabus. This is not, I know it, I admit it. I am sorry that I taught you something that was not required. Please forgive me. So. <clears throat>